dear speaker, dear uh, guest that watching us online. My name is Roman Nekoliak. I work as the International Relation Coordinator at the Center for Civil Liberties. Today, I will be uh, your moderator. If you new to our platform, I will br briefly explain. Uh, CCL is a Kyiv-based NGO. We are operating from 2007. And uh, last year, uh, Center for Civil Liberties uh, received the Nobel uh, Peace, Peace Prize for 2022. Today, uh, we will speak about crimes against the environment, equity, and uh, issues of uh, climate, climate justice. This video will be recorded, and you can revisit it for your educational purposes afterwise, afterwards. Our previous webinars on IHL, on human rights, on international diplomacy is available at uh, CCL YouTube channel, which I will gladly share with you in the chat. If you have questions, please send them to the chat and we will uh, tackle them at uh, Q&A session. You can raise your hands and voice your own question, or you can send them into the chat and I will do it for you. So the topic of our lecture today is crimes against the environment, war crimes, in the context of international uh, military conflict, conflict, Russian invasion of Ukraine. As we know, even before Novokakhovka dump explosion, the consequences for environment were drastic in Ukraine. The conflict has resulted in the destruction of natural habitats of various species. Uh, the forests are burned. It is impossible to conduct agriculture in the south of Ukraine. Also, some experts say that reaching a zero carbon emission goal before 2050 is not possible because uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine interrupted uh, this, um, these goals, and currently uh, countries are going back to using fossil fuel, uh, a fuel of uh, previous century, a fuel of previous generation, which is extremely uh, devastating for the nature. So not only human suffering in Ukraine, not only uh, Ukrainian civilians die, also the environment uh, pay a big tool in this, conflict. Even before Novokokhovka dump, uh, reconstruction of Ukraine was estimated by the, the, the journal The Economist Professional to be $46 billion. And uh, when we speak about post-war reconstruction, which inevitably will happen, we, it's open the opportunity to Ukraine to prioritize the transition to low-carbon economy for, for sustainable recovery and uh, to create to attract uh, foreign support for it. So there is the hope to do things um, right. Also, uh, I should mention that uh, currently, uh, last week, the so-called uh, uh, Green Deal uh, trade uh, of Ukrainian grain was uh, stopped by Russia, meaning uh, the several countries in Africa, several, more than a dozen countries in Africa, is uh, in the high risk of malnutrition, hunger, migration, and uh, child death. So conflict, Russian invasion of Ukraine, Russian aggressive war, is not only limited to suffering of our people, it is uh, faster the uh, climate crisis, it is uh, faster the negative consequences of climate change, which include uh, migration, not all migration, which include hunger and uh, War, uh, wars in uh, Africa region. Our uh, speaker today is uh, Miss Maud Serliev, uh, French uh, national. She is established expert in human rights, international criminal law, and IHL, international humanitarian law, and leading authority on ecocide, providing expert opinion for United Nations, for European Union. Most importantly, since November 2022, uh, Ms. Serliev uh, uh, has been advising the Office of Prosecutor General of Ukraine on the investigation and prosecuting the war crimes that impact the environment. She is also a judge, uh, a judge at National Court of um, Asylum in France. And uh, most, Im most importantly, uh, she is an expert for various international NGOs, which include uh, PPG, Public International Law Policy Group, 
GRC, Justice Rapid Response, and European Union project in Ukraine called Pravo Justice, where she provides her expert opinion on uh, uh, war crimes documentation investigation. Uh, Ms. Mott, the floor is yours. Feel free to share your uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, when you're ready. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Roman, for this very kind uh, presentation. I have indeed, I've seen already some familiar faces, which uh, I'm always happy to see amongst our participants. So, yeah, very happy to see you um, today. I have a very long PowerPoint presentation, which I will use uh, as a support. So bear with me when I go very quickly through certain um, slides. It's just for you to have some sort of uh, um, line to follow. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now with the PowerPoint presentation and you can tell me um, if you can see it properly. Correct, we can. Okay, excellent. So today we're going to talk um, about crimes against um, the environment. I will start with introducing uh, why I think um, the environment, the protection of the environment in armed conflict is so important. Um, then I will look a little bit into, as an introduction, into the armed into armed conflict and the environment before looking at the situation in Ukraine and with a special focus on the Kachovka Dam, and then we'll talk about ecocide as defined under uh, Article 441 of the Criminal Code of Ukraine and uh, war crimes as defined under Article 438 of the Criminal Code of Ukraine. And Roman, I rely on you to stop me if there's anything uh, wrong uh, as I'm speaking. And of course, we'll conclude with any questions uh, you may have. So first, uh, why? Environmental protection in armed conflicts is so important. Well, it's for many different reasons, but mostly because it's not only about the environment, it's um, about the impact that environmental destruction has uh, beyond just disrupting ecosystems, causing biodiversity law loss, exacerbating climate change. It uh, also hampers post conflict uh, recovery and sustainable development efforts. And in particular, what we tend to forget, um, perhaps when we're not diving into the issue of environmental harm in the context of a conflict, is the significance of uh, its impact and repercussions on human health, on preserve, which, which um, is connected to the fact that water resources are usually contaminated as a result of uh, uh, an armed conflict, um, agriculture access, the you know, use of landmines, for example, is, 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 very, uh, is turning farmland into minefields and ensuring an overall stability of all ecosystems, which, which is a list of reasons why upholding uh, or while protecting the environment in the context of a conflict is so important because it upholds the rights and well-being of those um, living on these uh, territories which are impacted by the environment. So it's not only about ecological conservation, it's really to preserve not only today's uh, generations and the people who depend on this environment, but also future generations. So now looking at armed conflict and the environment more specifically, um, so it's it's indeed fundamental to look into environmental issues in conflict affected areas for effective conflict resolution and peace building. We've seen examples in history of um, huge long term widespread uh, impact of the environment in the context of the Second World War, where the most famous example is Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where the nuclear weapons were used for the first time and hopefully the last but also the Vietnam War in the 70s, where the concept of ecocide was born and coined by a biology uh, Yale professor who was completely devastated by um, the impact of the use of this defoliant that he had contributed in developing on the territory, on the Mekong Delta. 
And, and closer to our um, time, uh, well, at least my time, because I do remember the moment where the oil wells in Kuwait were burned by Iraqi forces or where the, the, the draining of Mesopotamian marshlands in South Iraq was used also as a weapon of war. Um, so that's examples beyond Ukraine, beyond what's happening in Ukraine and before what's been uh, going on for the last uh, few years as the conflict started in 2014. Just to give you an idea of, of, of the impact of environmental um, damages in conflict, because it does have, like I said a bit earlier in my slides, like hinders post-conflict recovery if you can't access clean water, uh, breathable air, uh, edible food. It prolongs human suffering and displacement of communities and hinders the returns of these displaced persons. So all in all, um, Focusing, like taking the environment seriously, looking at the environmental impact of the conflict contributes to peace and sustainable developments. Um, so now that we have a bit of an overview of, of why it's so important to look at the environmental impact of the, um, of the conflict, let's take a closer look at what's been happening in Ukraine. Um, so, First of all, yeah, I wanted also to to mention that the legal the, the legal developments in the international law are very uh, have been quite limited, despite Nagasaki Hiroshima, despite the Vietnamese uh, destruction the, the destruction of the Vietnamese mangroves, despite um, the uh, burning of oil wells in Iraq, etc. These tragic incidents uh, in history haven't really led to significant legal developments, either in international humanitarian law or in international criminal law. The Rome Statute has one provision only, Article 824B, which, or B4, um, which only mentions uh, the environment incidentally and that the, the criteria to have this provision applied and forced are so restrictive that it hasn't happened so far. Um, and international human rights law is, is a little bit more developed, but not in the context of an armed conflict, which, again, are further elements to demonstrate the emergence, the urgency to address environmental protection in conflict. Um, and that's escalated during the full scale war in Ukraine. Um, which highlights the uh, environmental impact of conflict and the challenges associated with collecting evidence, identifying appropriate charges. It's not a straightforward operation. Um, now, what can we learn from Ukraine's context? We have a number of challenges and there are loads of complexities relating to access, relating to collecting uh, evidence, like I was saying, but also um, relating to what the law is. Um, but what we will be gaining, hopefully, through developing uh, investigations and when I say we what you in Ukraine you will be gaining and hopefully will that will expand and create precedent for the rest of the world are uh, insights gained from your practice uh, which can inform future efforts to strengthen uh, accountability for environmental crimes globally because again like when Roman was kindly introducing me my role is only advising ultimately as I, I just want to really really insist um because uh, of um because it's something I really care about it's it's it, it's up to the Ukrainian people and Ukraine as uh Ukraine's judiciary Ukraine's prosecution prosecutors to to um to push and that's what I've been observing is being done. Um, so now specific examples in Ukraine include um, destruction and threat to critical infrastructure, um, which has been caused by the use of modern warfare technologies um, and has resulted in substantial destruction and degradation that none, nobody uh, perhaps more better than you uh, know about and um, natural resources have also suffered significant damage uh, requiring urgent attention and that includes a number of categories such as nuclear sites and the radiation risks associated um, issue of water um, and the latest developments that we'll, we'll look at a little bit um, in, in more depth later 
um, with the uh, destruction or the targeting of the Nova Kahovka Dam, but also the other dams on the Libre River, um, which has had a huge impact on access to water and water treatment, not only well, in, well, in Ukraine, but also in Crimea. Um, then the industry and the industrial pollution, the best example that I could think of is the Azovstal um, uh, power, is the, uh, the plant uh, that was completely destroyed in Azovstal. And I've seen these big posters provide like um, showing support uh, for the people who were stuck there in the early days of the full scale conflict. And the targeting of fossil fuel infrastructure is another example, as well as the all of this um, and the impact it's had on the coastal and mar marine environment with um, a huge um, question mark regarding the uh, number of cetacean dolphins and other species who have been found uh, death on the seashores of the Black Sea and the Azov Sea. Now that's just um, a general, and it's already quite a, a grim one, uh, idea of the landscape of the environmental impact of the conflict. But if we look at the devastating impact of the destruction of the Nova Kachovka Dam in a little um, more detail, we see that, and I'm probably not going to, well, I know I'm not going to teach you anything, uh, or I don't want to lecture you about the Dnipro River, which is one of Europe's largest transboundary river. It passes through Russia, Belarus, Ukraine before reaching um, the Black Sea. It is Ukraine, pri Ukraine's primary water source um, for irrigation of uh, the land and also for a number of other, um, for, for um, so, so that people so that people can access to water um and Uc ukraine there were like six reservoirs along the Dnipro um for water energy and irrigation needs yeah one of the key um reasons why the uh damage caused to the kachovka uh, reservoir is also related to zaporizhia um but again it's 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 just um very very strategic and one of the of the six uh, reservoirs so its destruction has caused human and is causing humanitarian and ecological disaster with catastrophic flooding um uh in, catastrophic flooding of the whole Kherson region, up river and down river, dire consequences with multiple villages being completely covered into water. We don't know yet uh, how many people died as a result, how many people are houseless, uh, thousands of hectares of agricultural land being completely underwater, severe disruption, contamination of water supply, uh, 10 thousands of people losing access to drink, drinking water. Um, and, uh, and the fish and the uh, biodiversity impact and the petlands, which um, are uh, just disheartening and, and incredibly depressing to witness when you look at the, um, the videos reporting on these issues because well, for obvious reasons a lot um it's been it's been quite difficult to to access these territories um and in addition to the flooding, you have so the, the stagnating and contaminated water, which increased the disease, uh, the risks of disease housebreaks, the landmines that I was talking about initially, assuming that they had been mapped, uh, the, 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 the position had been mapped before, now it's completely impossible to know where they are, which increases the risks of uh, people getting um, injured or, or dying as a result of uh, stepping on the landmine, and the hazardous uh, chemical discharge from all the manufacturers who were situated um, along the river and uh, are now uh, covered by the floods. So that's another reason why it's so important to look at the environmental impact of the conflict and and it's what's happened in uh, Nova Kachovka is an unprecedented event um, which will have protect which it will have long term impacts which are expected to be more severe and I know some of us here um, know very well um, about all these issues. Now that tells you why it's so important um, to address environmental uh, crimes in Ukraine. Um, 
also to mitigate the immediate and long-term consequences of, of this destruction and, and contamination and try to restore um, the ecosystems, if possible, the water resources, the treatment and human health to what they used to be. Um, now, for that, um, Ukraine has a number of provisions, um, including I will not go into the, the, the provisions specifically dedicated in the Criminal Ukrainian Code to environmental destruction, environmental violations, because I think this is uh, for Ukrainian lawyers um, who have the expertise in looking at these provisions and interpreting them and employing them. Uh, but I will look at um, the provision cr criminalizing, incriminating ecocide under uh, Article 441 of the Criminal Code of Ukraine and uh, at the provision uh, in, involving war crimes. So first, the crime of um, ecocide. So the, defici the definition of, uh, of ecocide and the, um, the criminal Ukraine, well, Ukraine, first of all, is one of the very few countries with a, a number of former Soviet countries and Vietnam to have um, definition of uh, ecocide included in the criminal code. It's some sort. It's 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 it's, it's expanding now, um, despite a number of challenges uh, associated with um, the definition of this provision, which we'll uh, look into together. So the definition of ecocide, as translated from Ukrainian to um, English. Um, so I might have lost a number of nuances there, is mass destruction of flora and fauna, poisoning of air and water resources, and any other actions causing an environmental dis disaster. It's punished um, by uh, a, a term of imprisonment of eight to 15 years, and it applies not only in times of conflict, but also in times of peace. Although to my knowledge, to this day, there hasn't been any uh, case law um, produce, produced in Ukraine by the Ukrainian jurisdictions in relation to the enforcement of this provision. Now, looking at this definition, mass destruction of flora and fauna, poisoning of air, of water resources, and any other actions causing an environmental disaster, I see a number of challenges and ambiguity. Challenges uh, with the actus reus, so the uh, material element, but also with the mens rea, the psychological element. If you look at the actus reus, it's very difficult um, to explain or to identify exactly what we're talking about because the crime can manifest in various forms with no clear boundaries and there's no objective criteria for uh, the de determination of mass destruction of flora or fauna or contamination of water or um, environmental disaster. I look back, it is mass destruction of flora and fauna. At which point are we talking about mass destruction? In the context of the Kachovka, Nova Kachovka Dam, Yes, the threshold, uh, I, I think um, it would be difficult to, to, to debate that the threshold has not been reached given the impact it's had. But for other circumstances where perhaps there has been mass destruction of flora and fauna, but at a, 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 a somewhat of a lower scale, um, when, when do we start talking about ecocide? Similarly, poisoning of air or water resources, water resources in the context of um, Nova Kachovka, I think it would be um, a bit bold to challenge that uh, the threshold of uh, you know, poisoning or the, or the environmental disaster hasn't been reached. But if you look at, at uh, the early days of the full-scale conflict, there was also poisoning of uh, rivers, of the Irpin River, I believe, or um, of an estuary then are we talking about ecocide in these circumstances? And the last limb, any other actions causing an environmental disaster, at which point are we talking about environmental disaster? Chernobyl would be also an obvious one, um, arguably, well, not arguably, but 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 again, that, that's really, really high as a threshold. And of course, we wish that this threshold is never um, reached again or will never be reached again. But perhaps there's a, a room for interpretation of the threshold being a little bit lower, and in the in the way that the definition is uh, as we speak, it's it's not um, very easy to to understand or apply. Um, 
so yeah that was then the complexity in the mens rea there is no there is no such thing as mens rea um identified or defined under article 441 of uh, the provision which could um open to various interpretation and creates other challenges because we don't have any specific information regarding the form that the intent um is supposed to take which 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 uh, could also mean that the offense is considered as as non-intentional and whatever um happen whenever you have um a mass destruction of fauna and flora or poisoning of water and air resources or an environmental disaster as long as you can connect it with an individual um regardless of whether or not that individual has had the intention to cause it it there's a possibility for that person to be convicted or at least charged for for ecocide, um, which also creates issues with respect to you know the predictability and uh, legal certainty um, of the law, and 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 and, um, and issues attached to 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 fair trial. So. All in all, it's really interesting to have uh, such a provision uh, incriminated in the criminal co code, but like we uh, discussed together, there are challenges lying with respect to the actus res and mens rea elements of the crime. Um, addressing these ambiguities and trying to find uh, some clarity um, is really, really important um, for the sake of you know, effective enforcement and accountability, but also for the sake of, for, of fair trial. In the context of the ongoing conflict, another additional issue is who are we going to, who is, is going to be on, on, on the uh, accused stand and how uh, is it going to be possible um, to get the people charged with um, Article 441 and with the crime of ecocide to be there, which leads us to the um, possibility of conducting trial in absentia, which raises an awful lot of um, additional um, issues with, with, with respect to fair trial, etc., which I leave you uh, with because it's not the purpose of this uh, presentation. But that was um, the few remarks that I wanted to share with you regarding the possible application of Article 441 and the crime of ecocide as defined under the Ukrainian Criminal Code. Now, even more complicated is uh, war crimes and environmental destruction uh, and the way that Article 438 of the Criminal Code of Ukraine um, uh, attempts to include them in the Ukrainian legal order. I'm still actually myself figuring it, figuring out uh, how this work um, and um, the, the limits and challenges and opportunities that this provision creates. But let's look at it together. So again, English translation, and I apologize. Um, might be uh, flawed. I, Article 438, um, entitled Violation of the Rules of Warfare, um, discuss what well, is defined, refers to the cruel treatment of prisoners of war or civilians, which doesn't, um, which is not associated to uh, environmental related crimes, deportation of civilian population which could be the result of um, environmental destruction, to engage them in forced labor. Well, if the second limb uh, is connected to the first one, then no. Pillage of national treasures on occupied territories, that also arguably could be used in the context of prosecutions um, of crimes impacting the environment. But most importantly, use of methods of warfare prohibited by international instruments or any violations of rules of warfare stipulated by international treaties as ratified by the Fehorna Rada of Ukraine and also issuing an order to commit any such actions, etc. So we look at the, um, um, the way that this provision, which refers to rules of warfare as stipulated by international treaties ratified by the Parliament of Ukraine. There's a number of ambiguity with uh, this formulation, which I think is um, it's very important to be aware of them, to 
address them. They will be addressed by the judiciary, the judges eventually. Um, but but from a prosecution's or even a defense perspective, it's important to be aware of them. Um, because obviously, so it criminalizes violation of international humanitarian law by its reference to use of methods of warfare prohibited by international instruments or any violations of the rules of warfare recognized by international instruments. But what are we talking about? What are we talking about in general? But, and what are we talk, talking about specifically in the context of the environmental impact of the conflict? So we can look at international instruments and authorities which have been ratified by uh, Ukraine's parliament to try and understand this a little bit, a bit better. But as you probably all know, uh, the criteria for war crimes um, are, are quite clear, but not all of international humanitarian law violations amount to war crimes. Some of um, IHL violations are quite technical, um, or some of the provisions of the Geneva Convention or the Hague Law are, uh, are not actually def providing for definition, definition of, act of the elements of a crime. But to be considered uh, war crimes, violations must first be serious in nature and be cr cr criminalized by an international treaty or um, customary international law. And by criminalized, I think um, we can uh, agree that if you have the elements of the crime sufficiently defined. Now, like I was saying before, war crimes are the most serious violations under international humanitarian law. Um, and they are usually extracted, they, describe, they are extracted from the interpretation of the law of Geneva and the law of The Hague, which encompass many provisions, but not all of which are war crimes. And like I was saying, not all of these laws and treaties identify the elements of a crime stemming from violation of IHL instruments. That's in general, again, for any type of war crimes and not only the crimes um, related to the impact, the environmental impact of the conflict. Now, that said, it's very important to ensure uh, accountability, but with the clarity and precision required for the conduct of a, a war crime. So I believe that it will be up um, to the judges of Ukraine to help build a jurisprudence which will assist in um, perhaps building on international on, on international case law, which will assist in, in further in, in clarifying the actus reus and mens rea and the elements of the crime. Um, and I think I'm hope like I assume that this is something that's already being done. Now, with respect to environmental war crimes specifically, or crimes impacting the environment and conducting to the destruction of the environment, um, the, the classic provisions that I, uh, people look into are additional, the ones included in Additional Protocol 1 of the Geneva Conventions, which apply in the context of international armed conflict, more specifically Article 35. Three and Article 55 of Additional Protocol 1. Also, you could look at pillage and destruction of property, um, depending on the context, and there are other possible approaches, but it's pretty much a work in progress. Now, looking first at Additional Protocol 1 to the 1949 uh, Geneva Convention. So Additional Protocol 1 was adopted in 1976, interestingly, which is after um, the uh, impact of uh, the war in Vietnam and the use of defoliant. And like I was saying, two provisions are relevant for env environmental matters. Article 35.3, which prohibits the use of means of meth and methods of warfare intended or expected to cause widespread long-term and severe damage to the natural environment. Now, what's interesting with this particular article is that its application requires an attack. And looking at the, and an attack under international humanitarian law is, is, is defined, uh, well, has to satisfy a number of very specific criteria. And you might have seen, if some of you look at the European Law Journal, um, what, EGIL, European Journal of International Law, there's a very interesting uh, piece by, I'm sorry, I can't remember uh, his name, Marco, Marco something, but he's really, really uh, produced his preliminary remarks and observations 
literally hours after uh, the attack, uh, after what happened um, in uh, Novakachovka, and was actually questioning whether this could be considered as an attack under international humanitarian law and under the Geneva Conventions, precisely because it's an occupied, well, basically the dam uh, was destroyed as it was occupied by Russian forces. So would you consider that if the Russian forces, um, if it is demonstrated that the Russian forces have been indeed attacking the dam whilst it was occupied territory, is that an attack? Can you attack yourself? That, you know, you have a number of legal questions arising just from that particular requirement and you have additional ones also um, uh, relevant for the application of Article 35.3 and other articles possibly relevant to the attack of danger of, of uh, infrastructure um, um, retaining dangerous forces. That has, that's Article 56 of... Um, the Geneva Convention for that's another issue, uh, but that's one of the article that could potentially be imported and trans by um, Ukrainian judges into judges into the Ukrainian legal order using Article four three eight um, because the Geneva Conventions have been ratified by Ukraine. Indeed, doesn't mean that it's solution that it's 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 going to be the perfect solution, but it is there. And similarly with Article fifty five. Um, of Additional Protocol 1 of the Geneva Conventions. So Article 55 regulates the protection of the natural environment during international armed conflict. Um, you also have in this article references to um, widespread long-term and severe damage with no specificity as to what this means and where the threshold should be uh, set. And it also includes protection again, a protection against intent to cause harm to the health or survival of the human population. Now, the specificity of this article is that it prohibits attacks as well against the, the natural environment as reprisals. So that opens the door to a number of um, other issues and challenges related to uh, its enforcement. Now I've listed some of these issues, so challenges in proving intent to cause environmental harm during attacks, challenges in establishing a threshold for the criteria, I mentioned it very briefly just now. Um, but all these challenges, I think, could um, be addressed uh, potentially through collaborative efforts between uh, legal, legal experts, scientists, environmentalists, and other international bodies, um, which leads us to how key and important it is to collect reliable, uh, in, collect independently reliable and credible evidence to hold perpetrators accountable. But what, what's really interesting with respect to these three provisions, two provisions, sorry, 35.3 and 55, which have been um, incorporated, which are there since, which have been there since 1976, and the uh, adoption of additional protocol one of the, to the Geneva Convention, is that they haven't been applied yet. There's no case law at this stage. So uh, that's something that I will conclude on a bit later, but the situation in Ukraine could um, lead to uh, the first precedent being adopted eventually, uh, possibly. So aside from um, the Geneva Convention, what well, was aside from these two uh, specific provisions which specifically deal with um, the environment or uh, the natural environment being impacted by the conflict, you have other possible approaches, which I was um, telling you it's kind of a work in progress um, as far as the, the environment is concerned with their application, but the Geneva Conventions do prohibit damages caused by the, the deliberate targeting and uh, of certain infrastructures, civilian infrastructures, and prohibits the use of certain weapons during armed conflict. So we will briefly look at each of these category uh, together. First, the damages caused directly by what appears to be deliberate targeting, and second, damages caused directly or indirectly by prohibited weapons. Um, it's going to be a very short and brief and perhaps superficial analysis, but just to give you some sort of leads as to how to look at environmental crimes in the context of an armed conflict. So the damages for from deliberate targeting. I've uh, looked at various examples, which I think are particularly relevant to the situation 
uh, sadly, to the situation in Ukraine. So it's a targeting of industrial and agro-industrial facilities. So what talking about the Azov plant is also the Azot plant and the Odessa ammonia pipelines. Um, I haven't uh, got any information regarding the details of each of um, these plants and whether they've been targeting and the circumstances. Um, but I was just thinking that perhaps the um, should it be um, proved that they have been deliberately targeted uh, and that the military advantage uh, sought after is not excessive, provisions of, Gene of the Geneva Conventions could apply. Um, similarly, with energy infrastructure, uh, and we're talking about nuclear power plants, um, Chernobyl and Zaporizhia have been really intensively discussed in that respect, particularly after um, what happened to Novakahovka and the impact it's having, potentially having on the cooling of the the, the engine of the of the uh, of the whole system. Oil and gas facilities with Kalinivka, uh, I think it's it's what it's been publicly reported. Um, how uh, this particular um, reservoirs have been impacted, hydroelectric power plants. So we have Kachovka reservoir again, but also all all um, uh, like a number of other power plants which might have been targeted or have been targeted in the context of the conflict. So that's that's a number of different provisions could be um, mobilized to look at whether um, this targeting can be considered as a war crime. Um, and that's one possibility, one alternative approach. And there's also damages caused from prohibited weapons. So the, the one that comes to mind, not necessarily in relation to Ukraine, but is the use of phosphorus bombs, which has been quite uh, widespread, I understand, in the context of the Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict uh, on, on with respect to uh, Nagorno-Karabakh um, uh, and the tensions related to that. So phosphorus bombs have been used in that context. And perhaps, you know, it could be argued, um, but that remains to be demonstrated, that the use of certain uh, mines, depending on the uh, way they've been used, could also be considered uh, as a war crime. Um, and it has a huge impact on soil and farmland. Um, and probably will have an even expanded exponential one after um, the, the 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 flooding resulting from the destruction of Kahovka have has have have displaced these mines. So, targeting of um, civilian infrastructures, um, use of um, prohibited weapons, but what those are kind of uh, classic for lack of a better word, but what about indirect damages? Because a lot of indirect damages, uh, a lot of damages are caused to the environment indirectly. Um, so I've got a few examples here, like attacking ships at anchor, which has resulted in spread of toxins into the Black and Azov Sea. They weren't, uh, I guess, I don't know again, but any uh, intent to, uh, contaminate the water or or groundwater, groundwater, but but there might have been a knowledge. How do you deal with that? Um, legally speaking, can it be considered sufficient to establish mens rea? Uh, similarly, for water and water facilities, that depends also on the threshold. When attacks of contaminated groundwater, a disrupted water, freshwater supply, a destroyed sewage treatment facilities, and the Kohovka Dam is sadly another. Um, horrible illustrations, uh, illustration of these uh, uh, difficulties and challenges. And the wildlife reserves and protected areas, here again, completely flooded um, of the, all the shelling of the Kinban spit next to Kherson. Um, a number of, of, of these um, impacts and examples of the forest fires, how do you deal with them uh, with the uh, body of law that we have at our disposal and which, again, to my knowledge, or to a large extent, have never been uh, used with a view to uh, holding accountable those responsible for the environmental impact of the conflict. Um, so all our questions that are up in the air, um, and one of the reasons I keep hammering it, but it's true, is that because no case law has 
been delivered to assist in identifying actus reus, the actus reus or mens rea. We're talking, and that's that's um, we're in the Nuremberg trials. There have been some um, decisions and case law um, regarding the scorched earth policies uh, applied by certain uh, Nazi forces in the context of their withdrawal from um, Poland, Norway, or Finland. But it was it hasn't led like to anything concrete regarding any potential act, um, criminalization of this uh, behavior. And what's really interesting is that well, because of the huge uh, scale of the environmental impact of the conflict in Ukraine with the flooding of mines, and that was again prior to 2022 in Donbas, in Luhansk, in Donetsk, mines have been flooded, ecosystems have been destroyed, protected areas in Crimea as well. Um, so a heavy pollution uh, I suspect can has well has been reported by certain NGOs, um, and it's it's I'll go back to what I introduced this presentation with, which is how important it is to look into it um, with a view to protecting Ukrainian people's health and preventing further environmental um, dis destruction. So what's really uh, interesting at this point in time is that. Ukrainians um, judiciary has developed, deployed in, in unprecedented efforts to investigate and prosecute environment related crimes. And between this and, and, and the President Zelensky peace plan, there um, an unprecedented also alignment of, of factors um, where you have on the one hand the judiciary, which is determined to look into these issues. On the other hand, the political will um, to call for these issues also to be looked into. And we've reached also an international momentum, in my view, where the international community, um, and we're talking about the Western mostly, but not only South um, America also is very uh, adamant to provide to, to when it comes to the protection of of the environment, but the international community also pushing perhaps more than ever for um, these particular um, issues and matters and, and and the protection of the environment to be looked into. Um, so. I wanted to um, insist on the importance of accountability of justice so that those responsible for severe widespread and long-term environmental damage without military necessity, that's a very uh, also important criteria, must face accountability in court because that will lead to creating a deterrent effect beyond Ukraine in other um, conflicts uh, and, and possibly, sorry, um, promote for well, that's a bit of a utopia, but you know, uh, armed conflict to be conducted more responsibly. Um, and like I was saying, on, you don't only have in Ukraine dedicated investigators, prosecutors, and the international community's support and assistance to uh, lead to uh, addressing these unprecedented environmental challenges, but also present Zelensky's 10 point peace plan. And I extracted from um, the English translation that I could find those of the 10 points which I found directly connected um, to uh, environmental related issues. So the plan calls for radiation and nuclear safety with a focus on restoring security around Europe's um, largest nuclear power plant Zaporizhia. Food security, which Roman was mentioning uh, in, its, in, in his introduction as well. Uh, and which has re which is rising um, recent additional concerns with what happened uh, these last few days or yesterday, and um, regarding the agreement um, to let Ukraine's grain export uh, being shipped to the world's poorest nation nations, energy security, um, with the restoration of Ukraine's power infrastructure, and the prevention of ecocide. The protection of the environment with a focus on demining and restoring water treatment facilities. So to conclude, I'll go back to the fact that we are 
uh, I think, at a shift, at a tipping point uh, on many different levels. And it's sort of, there's this shifting forces um, with, in Ukraine where um, I see it a bit like the rule of law um, versus the law of the jungle. It's a bit, of course, corny and um, and and réducteur, as we say in French. Um, but the chance, the, the 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 conditions are gathered in my in my view for case law to help push for an adaptation of the law to um, the environmental and climate crisis that is happening to us beyond the, the the borders of Ukraine. And as I think this presentation has demonstrated, indeed, there is you have uh, bodies of law, you have legislation, but it's not really tailor-made to, to protect or deter the destruction of the environment. So with this, um, with customary international law, uh, which could provide a foundation for to address this, the, the most serious violations, we could be at a similar uh, point in time as the one that was uh, that the, the world was facing um, after World War II, when we're looking at crime, crimes against peace and that crimes against humanity were not quite uh, identified. Now, with respect to the crimes against the environment, I see something perhaps a little comparable, um, the potential for something perhaps comparable to happen through, again, and thanks to the efforts of the prosecutors, the investigators who are, who, who are taking huge challenges and working incredibly hard to collect the evidence and um, present cases to um, the, the Ukrainian judges. So I hope that will lead to ensuring accountability and justice for offenses, even though the specific treaty provisions are, are a little lacking, and that will also help create a deterrent effect for the future in the context of other conflicts. So I hope that has answered uh, some of your, the questions you might have had, and I'm happy to um, answer any additional ones you may still have. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mott, thank you for your excellent uh, presentation. So uh, currently we listen a lecture about crimes against the environment. We received your uh, questions in the chat and we will start with the uh, written one by Mr. Mikhail. Is it uh, reasonably to assume that a way to prove somebody guilt in ecocide is similar to proving the crime of genocide? So what legal scholars think about these uh, two type of crimes and how to prove guilt, how to prove motivation intent? Um, there is no such thing as special intent um, when it comes to ecocide. Um, for genocide, there is, you know, it's a special intent to destroy in whole or in part a group of population based on national, racial, religious or ethnic grounds. That's the biggest difficulty for a genocide uh, to be uh, demonstrated because the special intent is incredibly is an incredibly high threshold for ecocide the, the issue is not the threshold of the special intent the issue is that it's a very very vague um crime so it could it, it could be used a very vague crime for which there has been no proposed interpretation um and and I, I don't know how else to answer uh, your question. I, I think it's comparable in the sense that it's an incre incredibly powerful word, an incredibly powerful concept to gather people around um, the idea that the environmental destruction should be deterred, should be prevented. But legally speaking, that's, you know, devil being in the details, that's where um, it's still tricky. And that's where I think you'll find a lot of the reasons why it hasn't yet uh, been defined, uh, or no universal legal definition has yet been accepted at the international level. Um, despite the proposal for a definition published in June 2020, 21 or 20 yeah 2021 um which uh i think is an incredibly interesting step forward 
but um, still not the um, ultimate answer since that was proposed by a, a collective of uh, experts with no um, state support and for the International Criminal Court to amend its Rome Statute you need um, a, a quorum of states to support it but it's difficult to obtain given the fact that the definition itself uh, is difficult to agree on um, because of all the risks that it involves for you know the countries who are um, seeking to develop and grow and for which ecocide could be seen as a typically uh, western obstacle like you've had it all and now you don't want us to give you, do, you don't want to leave us the, the means and opportunity to uh, follow your path because it's um easier for you i know it's not particularly politically correct to say but that's actually what i think um, if fairly, uh, thank you i understand you i hear you a good point uh, may i give a floor for uh, miss olena she raised a hand in zoom Olena, you can voice your question by yourself. Please unmute. Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, for your lecture, it was a pleasure for me to hear that um, there are people who really look into such crimes and who really investigate the matter. And I really hope that uh, Ukraine uh, will create, unfortunately, or maybe luckily for, mm. the, in, uh, for the international law, the precedent in terms of ecocide. So... I have a question, um, just a bit of uh, input from my side. As far as I understand, I mean, we have a clear division because there are environmental, so international environmental crimes, and there is a crime of ecocide. And these things are a bit different because ecocide, um, it requires an attack, and it's something that is enshrined under Geneva Convention, uh, whereas international environmental crimes, they are more or less under national, um, they are considered as national crimes criminal offences or crimes no. that have transnational Sorry. character? Or... Not exactly. I can, okay. I can, I, maybe I wasn't clear enough, but, um, and I will answer your question, but I just want to clarify very quickly. For ecocide, there's no need for an attack. Ecocide happens in times of peace, in times of conflict. E the difficulty with ecocide is you, do, you don't really know what you have to prove. You have to prove mass destruction of fauna and flora, poisoning of water, air, or anything else that results in an environmental disaster. So it can be anything. You could argue, that, for example, that you chop down a tree in your garden, and some people will consider that an environmental disaster. So what is ecocide? That's the issue, but it doesn't require the um, evidence of an attack. It requires evidence of environmental disaster. And that's Article 441 of the Criminal Code of Ukraine. Article 448 calls for the importation of international humanitarian law as ratified by Ukraine into the Ukrainian legal order. And that itself is problematic because what is international humanitarian law? What are we talking about? Which of all these treaties and conventions and laws of The Hague and laws of Geneva actually provide for a definition of a crime or crimes and which of these crimes are actually relevant to the protection of the environment. The most straightforward ones are those from additional protocol one of uh, the Geneva Conventions, article 35 and three and 55. And even with those of uh, uh, those two, including included in, inter in international, in additional protocol one, sorry, it's not clear what is meant by long spread, severe, and uh, long-term severe and widespread impact on the environment. And it also is unclear as to how you're going to assess uh, when these environmental uh, destructions are justified by a military advantage. So, and all of this is unclear because it's never been um, ruled upon in any international or in, or national um, jurisdiction, 
just to clarify, but I'm, I'm listening to you and your question, sorry. Thanks a lot. Well, that was part of the question actually to clarify the difference. And then the question itself is, as far as I understand, now we can have basically two processes parallelly done. So it means that in Ukraine, we can have the process under national criminal law, right? Um, on, the, on the criminal offense of ecocide, but at the same time, we can have international legal processes. And since, for example, I have, um, I don't know if, uh, as, as far as to, open to my knowledge, there is no like international framework convention that really covers international environmental crimes into Alia, their enforcement. Uh, for example, as far as I understand the process, how it can really be enforced or any judgment can be raised is that we can, um, because under the Roman statute, right, mm -hmm. um, there is no real uh, crime of ecocide or any environmental crime involved there. So the, the way Ukraine can go to now is actually, for example, go to ICJ, where we have case Ukraine versus Russia, and try um, there, or what are then the legal ways, like in which international institution can we then deal with that um, case further thank you well it's a very good question and thank you for that and there i see several layers in your question the first uh, layer is that you don't have to go to an international tribunal you have this provision 438 which imports international law to the extent that it's consistent with ukrainian uh, legal framework the ukrainian constitution etc into uh, your own body of laws, the same way that, um, let's say, uh, in, in, in France, I, 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 I can't remember exactly where you have the, you have the provisions of um, some Geneva Conventions, or um, it's been imported and transposed differently. And that's, I, I leave it to you as you know, experts, Ukrainian lawyers, to uh, to see exactly how the process of importing uh, conventions ratified by your parliament uh, works. But the way I see it, if I were a, a Ukrainian uh, lawyer or Ukrainian prosecutor at this point in time, I would definitely look at the possibilities that this particular provision gives me to use the provisions of the international treaties um, ratified by uh, the Rada um, and use them to support an argument, to support a legal ground and to um, conduct investigations and prosecutions. I don't know if, if that's clear enough, but the first step to me is using domestic jurisdictions and pushing for the interpretation of domestic legislations. That's a first answer. It, would you agree, Olena? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your answer. So that, yeah, that's clear for that's, me. Yeah. That's one aspect, and that's, in my view, the first step. Then it doesn't, it, it doesn't prevent, and you're right that both can be done in parallel, at least from the system that I'm familiar with. You can charge two different provisions at the same time. I don't know if it's possible under uh, Ukrainian criminal law and Ukrainian criminal procedure, but you could, put, for example, uh, seek uh, for, well, it's it's interesting to look in, into the possibility of charging ecocide under 441 and charging environmental destruction as, as prohibited um, uh, by Article 35.3 uh, of the Geneva Convention on the other hand together. For a specific example, that's one um, possibility. It doesn't prevent to have those dealt with in parallel. Or look into whether and to which extent it's possible under Ukrainian proce criminal procedure and Ukrainian criminal law. Now, that doesn't prevent from indeed going to the International Court of Justice uh, to look for if 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 there are any reasons for this, um, provided that. We're talking about international environment, multilateral environmental agreements or bilateral environmental agreements, which have been both ratified by both the Russian Federation and Ukraine, and where you have a specific um, impact. They also, some multilateral environmental agreements also have compliance mechanisms. Um, so it's, it could be interesting to look into this. And it doesn't also prevent from uh, looking at the International Criminal Courts 
um, and how the existing provisions of the international of the Rome Statute could be creatively interpreted um, with view to, for example, consider um, in a, through a different lens uh, the targeting of civilian infrastructures and the impact they've had on um, civilian populations or you know, destruction of property. If you have a forest that's been completely destroyed as a result in, in, in close connection with the, with the conflict, see how Article 8, uh, contraband to be contraband with the number, which provides for, which prohibits destruction of property under certain circumstances could be applied. So there's a, there's a number of possibilities um, and they're all very blurry, but that's why we're here to think about them and to push for the fog to <laughs> disappear, perhaps. Well, uh, to follow up on what you just said, can you uh, answer the following question? What other evidence can be used to prove the amount of the environmental damage? Maybe a case law, a common knowledge, how the amount being calculated? Well, environmental damage, well, that, that's just the, one of the difficulties with um, the word environment is that it is, that is a very large and very um, fluid concept. You could talk about environmental in a social context, environment in a working context. And, and here, environmental damage, what exactly are we talking about? It could be, again, um, the 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 you know, environmental damage, if we look just at um, the environmental impact and the env environmental damage caused as a result of the, the destruction of the Novakachovka dam, then you have biodiversity, like the biodiversity has been impacted. Are we talking about that category of, of environmental damage? You have extreme pollution because of the fact that you had all these plants, industrial plants along the riverbanks, which have been completely flooded, causing hazardous waste to be disseminated into nature. Are we talking about that uh, category of environmental damage? You have um, uh, the fact that Zaporizhia power plant is potentially uh, not cooled down because of the same of the the the, the level of the reservoir going uh, diminishing. If um, we we are uh, getting like if if anything happens and touch wood it won't would that could be another category of environmental damage. So. Evidence used to prove the amount of environmental damage, it depends on the environmental damage you're talking about. It depends, it's very, very specific and very technical. Oil spill, for example, that's um, oil spill. I'm sure that um, like Victor, who is a specialist and who I see is amongst the attendant, could tell us much, could tell you much, much more than I would ever could about how difficult and challenging and how diverse and varied um, the issue of evidence to be collected to establish and prove um, the causal link between the conflict and a specific category of environmental damage is. So th there's no easy answer to, you, to, to your question. There's a multiple of different answers, which all depend on very specific types and categories of environmental damage, depending on the very specific type and category uh, of situation. Ms. Mood, I will ask for five more minutes of your time because we have three really uh, good questions. The next one, to which court should Ukraine apply with the claim for compensation for damage to the environment? Is there is something like international body like ICC or Court of Justice in Hague, which specifically work on environmental damage claim? Um, I think I partially answered that question, um, which was touched upon by Olena. Um, like when it comes to the competent jurisdiction, it very much depends here again on the specific issue that you're facing. If you're talking about uh, wetlands being impacted, um, there's the Ramsar Convention. The Ramsar Convention protects certain a, a list of, of wetlands. 
Uh, it provides also for um, a specific compliance mechanism, if I'm not mistaken. So it's not a jurisdiction, it's a mechanism. Perhaps there's a possibility to go there. Um, same with the Bern uh, Convention on Biodiversity. It's been used by the Azeri against Armenia. Um, now, it's more of an arbitration, ad hoc arbitration uh, mechanism, specifically for biodiversity. Um, for larger, um, uh, for, for if, if you look at it from a different perspective, which is not only specific to uh, a, a protected area or a protected species, then, like I said, you can look at ecocide, you can look at 448, you can look also at a number of other provisions which are applicable and defined under the current Ukrainian criminal code and see which ones are the best suited to what your ultimate objective is, how um, and to who you have um, in your mind or who you know might be responsible uh, for these specific um, environmental impacts. And that's for domestic court. You could also look at, as Olena suggested, the International uh, Court of Justice, um, and 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 it, depending again on the specific situation, specific convention that's been ratified by both the Russian Federation and um, Ukraine. And you could also think about the International Court of Justice, uh, the International, International Criminal Court or also perhaps the United Nations uh, Court for the Law of the Seas. So creativity and keeping an open mind, uh, but there's again, no, not one answer um, for to this question. Thank you. And maybe the last one, uh, explain historical phenomenon of ecocide in international law. I can uh, briefly, um, say that the discussion of uh, war causing environmental damage go back to the First World War, the Great War, when the poisonous uh, gases were used in the Western and Eastern Front, killing not only combatant, but, uh, but animals and uh, polluting uh, the agricultural uh, soil in Northern uh, France. Uh, Ms. Mott mentioned the use of uh, nuclear, uh, atom bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And also in 20th century, there was a conflict in um, Vietnam where US Army used uh, also a poisonous gas that uh, uh, make prob problematic to conduct agriculture and uh, led to diseases connected to, uh, to cancer. So the discussion of uh, such kind of um, damage going through the 20th century through both uh, World, uh, yeah, but if I may just add, the actual, uh, the first time that the word ecocide was used was in 1970. It was in the context of the war crimes, war crime conference held in Washington, D.C. in the presence of Arthur Galston, who's this Yale professor in biology who coined the uh, term for the first time. And then it was used again in 1972 in Stockholm, in the Stockholm conference by Olaf Palme, who was at the time the prime minister of Sweden. And he used it again to draw attention to the issue as they were agreeing on the, the terms of the Stockholm declarations, which led uh, to the creation of the United Nations environmental program. And then it was sort of kept, um, um, in the background, there was some discussions as to its inclusions or inclusions of geocide or ethnocide in the context of the review of the Genocide Convention with the Whitaker, Whitaker Report in 1981. There was another um, uh, like proposed uh, draft for uh, an Article 26 for the draft um, um, Crimes Against Humanity, etc., was by Christian Tomasha, a German uh, scholar, legal scholar, who actually pointed out the fact that in the 80s, we still thought that re all the resources of this planet were renewable, that we would have water forever, that the air would always be clean, that there was not going, that we, there was not the awareness that we have now, 46 in Europe, um, in Western Europe, in France, 46 degrees, 
in the beginning of July with respect to the climate, which is a different issue, but still. So that's why it was not really included eventually in the Rome Statute in 1998. It was considered, but not included because there was a choice to, to have the Rome Statute being specifically anthropocentric and not looking at uh, ecological or environmental issues. People thought at the time it would be expanding the scope a little too far. And uh, similarly, in the context of the ICTY, uh, International Tribunal for ex yugoslavia or, or ICTYR, International um, Tribunal for Rwanda, none of these issues were discussed. And um, the only moment that, um, interestingly, the Rome Statute and the ICC Prosecutions Office has um, connected the dots between a, a geno genocide provision and an environmental issue is in the context of the war in Darfur back in 2010 when an arrest warrant was delivered against Omar al-Bashir, the president of uh, Sudan at the time, for deliberately poisoning the water wells that were uh, exclusively used by certain ethnic uh, populations. So it was considered, um, it was charged under Article 6C um, of the Rome Statute, which calls for, uh, which prohibits uh, creating conditions which will lead to the um, uh, inhuman treatment and conditions of life leading to the destruction of a population. So that's genocide, not ecocide. But altogether, um, nothing happened between the 70s and 2010s. In 2010, you had Polly Higgins, a UK lawyer, who tabled a proposal to the UN General Assembly, didn't go much further. Then you had a French scholar who is um, Laurent Néret, who um, conducted a very interesting collective and collaborative research, which led to the publication of a book from Ecocide to Eco Crimes. Then you also had another French activist called Valérie Cabanez, who in 2015 proposed a third um, option for a definition. Laurent Néret was also uh, suggesting the adoption of two different conventions, one for ecocide, one for eco crimes. Um, I mean, you have many scholars that have forgotten a lot. You have this um, Yale lawyer also, what's his name, Richard um, Pork, I think, who uh, also in the 70s suggested the adoption of a specific convention on ecocide. But all of this has led us to today um, where you have the, the, the parliaments of the Council of Europe uh, voting a resolution to adopt ecocide. You have the EU parliament, which is, uh, which we are just 2023, which is also producing a report calling for the inclusion of ecocide in uh, a directive on environmental crimes in Europe. Um, it's, it's, it's really sort of boiling uh, at the moment. We have bubbles um, everywhere. Um, calling for this provision to be adopted. Various domestic um, legislations also calling for uh, for these adoptions. And if that's really of interest to you, I can send you a list of literature and an article that I um, published, but it was three years ago, which gives you a bit of a background, further background and more in-depth analysis as to what ecocide is about, if, if, if you'd like. Uh, Sam, yeah, I will definitely share materials that you've uh, sent to me. I will share with every registered uh, interactive participants. Uh, since we are uh, almost at the end of the, our event, I will uh, briefly uh, uh, mention that this web webinar is a part of Ukrainian Criminal Justice Week, a series of uh, webinars and panel discussion organized by the Center for Civil Liberties and uh, PPG, Public International Law policy group. Here we speak about IHL, we speak about international criminal justice. We, uh, today we will also host another webinar about uh, cyber warfare. On Thursday we will speak about crime of aggression and atrocity crimes. Also we will uh, clarify the jurisdiction of ICC, ad hoc international criminal tribunals of the past, and the International Court of uh, Justice. So all jurisdictions will be uh, clarified. If you are a legal student or um, young professional, civil servant, Ukrainian refugee that uh, staying abroad, you can learn IHL uh, this week uh, together with us. 
On this note, uh, Ms. Mott, thank you for your excellent presentation and uh, for managing interesting question and answer uh, session. We are uh, ready to finish. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for all these uh, very interesting questions. Thank you very much. Okay.